I'm going to highlight sort of the state of play where we are today um, and, and lay a foundation, I think, for what things that, that Jared and Leah will be talking about. Uh, but I really want to, uh, to start out uh, by telling you all just a, a little story. It's a family story, um, but it's really about the, the end of the company man. Right, so my, my grandfather, and here they are here, uh, my grandfather, uh, uh, among the jewelry he left me when he died, left me uh, tie pins, right? This is something of a, an age gone by. We, we don't wear tie pins that much anymore, but there's a special uh, significance to these tie pins. These tie pin, this one here was given to him uh, on the 25th anniversary at the Cincinnati Gas and Electric Company, the 25 years working at, at CG&E. Uh, this one... Uh, was given to him uh, on the 40th anniversary, uh, two years before he retired, 40th anniversary working at Cincinnati Gas and Electric Company. This was the employer that he uh, started with when he graduated uh, from college, uh, and it's the employer he stayed with his entire professional career. One single employer. Um, me, on the other hand, uh, my first job out of law school uh, I had for three months. Um, now, I, that might say more, more about me uh, than my grandfather or the state of, uh, of, uh, of employment in America, but that's not that far uh, fetched compared to many other people's experiences uh, in the working world. Uh, and this is just to give you some context. Uh, this is the data from 1983 uh, through 2010 uh, covering those people between 45 and 64 who had 25 or more excuse me, 25 or more years of tenure at the same employer. Uh, it's been declining over time. If I were to back this up uh, 20 years prior, you would see the trend lines just, they continue to go down and decrease over time. People are not staying uh, at jobs like they used to. Some of this is a product of, of uh, the economy. Some of this is a product of our expectations about work, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that uh, in a minute. But uh, this goes by, by uh, age cohort. So this shows you job tenure uh, by age cohort, right? Uh, the thick uh, purple color here uh, is 10 years or more on the job. Now, it's difficult to expect a 16 to 24-year-old to have spent uh, more than 10 years on the job, but somehow some slight sliver have. I'm guessing those are people who are <laughs> working at family businesses or something like this. Um, but what you will see is people aged 25 to 34. Very small amount of them have spent more than 10 years uh, at the same employer. Uh, that, that number's declining over time, and you see probably the people aged 65 and older, and even 55 to 64, um, that's pretty much the end of more than half of people uh, working at the same job for over 10 years. Uh, the stats over the last 15, 20 years say that the average American worker will have something like between uh, six and nine jobs in their professional career. That's a lot of job hopping. Uh, and that will only continue to increase uh, as work becomes more flexible and our expectations about work change as we expect more flexibility uh, and, and openness in the way we approach our work environment. So we've seen an end of the company man, but this has also been paired up with the rise of what I would call the one-man company. So this is data from uh, the IRS looking at uh, the percentage of 1099 forms being issued over the last 15 years versus the, the number of W-2s. From the year 2000 uh, to the year 2015, uh, the number of 1099s issued has increased by approximately 22%. has gone up drastically. The number of W-2s being issued over that same period uh, has stagnated, slightly declined. It's sort of 4% below what it was uh, in the year 2000. So we're, we're clearly seeing a change in the way that people approach work, no longer going to uh, a single employer and staying forever. And more often than not, people, um, people working uh, for themselves. Now this is a product somewhat of our, our continued reliance on technology to find work, right? I, actually, I think all three of us here have done uh, a good amount of research on the growing sharing economy, right? That's just one example, but the, the reliance on, on independent work predates the sharing economy. And people for decades have been moving away from traditional employment uh, opportunities and more toward these, uh, these I, some would call it contingent, uh, I would call it a flexible or on-demand uh, working relationships. 
So you do have the circumstances surrounding work are certainly changing. Uh, and that is something that's clear in the data, it, regardless of how you look at it. The way that we are uh, working in America is changing. But it's not so much, I think, oftentimes the popular narrative is that this is, um, this is a product of circumstances, that we are simply uh, responding to uh, what's available to us. You know, millennials uh, aren't, aren't working for an employer because they are, not, uh, they are not given those opportunities. But I think the way that millennials and across the board, uh, the way people prefer to work, the way people think about work, and the way we talk about work is changing. Uh, and I'll, I will give you some, exa some examples of this. Uh, in a recent uh, survey of, of millennial workers, the question was posed to them, what factors are most important um, when looking at an employer? What makes an employer most attractive to you? One in four millennials uh, responded, flexible working arrangements. That is, they prefer flexibility over a lot of the other things that people typically think of when they think of work. Uh, when, when the millennials were asked a question about the future of work, um, looking forward, what do you expect out of work? One in three said that they expected mainly flexible hours. Flexibility is certainly a piece of, uh, of the puzzle that millennials are trying to work with. Uh, the, and it's not just millennials, it, it spans into uh, the generation before millennials. Um, this is something that people are looking to, especially as telework, telecommuting, um, the idea of working from home has become an easier option for people as information technology and the internet has made that more readily available. Um, now this looks at uh, the way we talk about work. This is a, a Google Ngram. I'm not sure if, uh, if any of you are, f are familiar with this, but basically what Google can do is it can uh, go through the entire corpus of uh, all of the things that Google can get its hands on both written material as well as the stuff uh, on, online that sort of are results that return to you uh, when you search things in Google. And these are just some words that I pulled together uh, with a couple other researchers at Mercatus uh, to get at uh, the way people are talking about work. This may be difficult to see, but I'll, I'll go ahead and outline them for you. This is a, just the term independent contractor. Uh, telework, telecommuting, workplace flexibility, and work-life balance. Um, independent contractor, I think I'll, I'll start there. Independent contractor is certainly something that uh, became extremely popular as a term in the late 1990s. I think you can see it just sort of just spike in the late 1990s, and it has declined since then. Although, thinking back to the chart I showed you before, the rise in independent contracting has continued. Uh, so in one way, people are no longer thinking of themselves as an independent contractor. People are just thinking of themselves as working. Uh, we've no longer thought of independent contracting as something separate or different or uh, wholly incompatible with the traditional way we've thought about work, but it's just become the way people work. Uh, same with telecommuting. Telecommuting uh, in like the year 2001 hit its peak and it's been declining since then. Uh, just a show of hands, how many of you when you work from home tell people that you're telecommuting or teleworking? Right, no, nobody, nobody talk, maybe a couple people talk about it. But most people don't use those terms, right? You just say, I'm working, right? I'm on my computer, you know, in my pajamas in my living room, and I'm working, right? You don't say I'm telecommuting. It's become a part of our expectations, and it's, it's, it, it, we've no longer used those terms because they've just become wholly ingrained in the way we think about work in the modern economy. So that's telework uh, and telecommuting. And then here are two other ones that I wanted to just include. Workplace flexibility and work-life balance. These are two things when you hear people talk about millennials in the workplace, these are two things people stress a lot. Is they say millennials are striving for work-life balance. Not in the same way that our parents did or their parents did, uh, but somehow that has become something that millennials are looking for when they're deciding where they work, who they work for, uh, and, and, and what type of work they do. And the same is, uh, Workplace flexibility. Both of these, they almost don't even show up. And I think even at this distance, you all aren't that far away from me, you can barely see them. I mean, they're, they're terms that, for the most part, have just entered uh, the, the public discourse in the way that we're talking uh, and thinking uh, and, and uh, really vocalizing our preferences about work. Um, but as Robin mentioned before, although our, our expectations and our arrangements have changed, 
the law that dictates the way that employees, workers, and employers um, interact with each other has not. So this is uh, a rundown of some of the laws that are enforced by the Department of Labor for the most part, in other uh, agencies as well, but primarily by the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor enforces somewhere around 180 separate laws that dictate who can work, when they can work, who they can work for, the circumstances under which work can take place, workplace safety, so the environment in which you can work with, pretty much every aspect of someone's working life is touched in some way uh, by, uh, by our current uh, legislation that exists on the books. Uh, but to put it in some context, the average, so this is the foundation, just the ones that I'm laying, laying out here, this sort of lays the foundation for labor law in America. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act here in a, in a moment, which is 78 years old. Um, but the average age of this legislation is 64 years old, on average. The average American worker is 42. Uh, it predates the age of most workers, and it certainly has, has found in many ways to become anachronistic to the way we think, talk, and expect uh, to work. So while the law is relatively old, um, our, the way we're, yep, while the law is relatively old, uh, the way that the Department of Labor, for example, continues to, uh, to apply the law uh, has continued, right? Uh, that they've gone ahead and they found new ways to apply old laws. And very often that's not finding ways to adapt the old regulatory approach to the new model of work. Very often that's trying to fit the new model of work into the old regulatory regime. So just two charts I want to I wanna show you here. Uh, this is the word count from the Federal Register. Uh, just... Um, just uh, a product of the Department of Labor. And uh, this one shows from 1997 to 2012, uh, we see a 22% increase in the word count. That's the way typ typically people count regulations is by words or pages. This is the word count. Um, the restriction count over that same period has also grown 12%. Now this is not the product of, of the, the agencies uh, applying new law. This is the product of the agencies taking these old laws, those uh, on average 61-year-old laws, and finding new ways to fit them in to our new working uh, environment. Uh, and it's, it's become a problem, especially in uh, an environment that has become so reliant and so dependent on our ability to connect with one another in new and different ways. Right? The, the hallmark of the sharing economy has been one of uh, people using smartphones, the internet, and the, the apps and platforms created within them to connect and transact with one another. Uh, the way that people think about working, the way people choose to work, uh, has also radically changed because of our ability to use information technology to remove the physical presence from the office, right? There are people, my supervisor, for example, uh, lives in Angel Fire, New Mexico, right? Three hours from the nearest airport. Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, I have not seen that much of a difference. We're, we're in just as much contact today as we were before he moved. Uh, and that's a product of uh, our ability to, um, to use these new technologies uh, to change uh, the nature of work. However, I would say um, that while the nature of work has changed, uh, our public policies toward them have not. And I think Jared's going to talk about this uh, uh, in a minute, but uh, that's a big problem when you think that uh, millennials, and not just millennials, but people across age groups are becoming more reliant on the, on the independent contractor uh, relationship to find work and to supplement work. Uh, and our public policies uh, do not know how to uh, adapt and change with them. Um, and it's, it's become clearly apparent that uh, our approach at least at a federal level, has, has become out of date. Um, but even I would caution against trying to update it for today's work environment because that will continue to change. Even laws passed today uh, that, look at, um, that look at the work environment as it is today 
uh, as soon as the ink is dry on the paper, will most likely be out of date as the work environment and our working relationships continue to radically change. Um, and so in, in conclusion, I want to say in a rapidly changing and, and te technologically driven environment, there is a need for public policies to reflect Moore's Law. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Moore's Law, um, this is essentially a, and it's, it was a prediction that has now become a description of the way technology has evolved over the past uh, 50, 60 years. And it basically says that uh, computing power will continue to double every two years. To give you an example, in 1971, when Intel came out with the first uh, commercial processor, the fastest car in the world was the Ferrari Daytona that hit a max speed of 185 miles an hour. Uh, the Twin Towers were the tallest buildings in the world at 1,362 uh, 1, feet. Um, just earlier this year, Intel released a processor with 400,000 times more computing power than the one they released in 1971, right? Information technology has radically changed. If you think about it in the context of the physical world, uh, if cars <laughs> got that much faster, uh, cars would currently be going one-tenth the speed of light, and buildings would be halfway to the moon already. Uh, so we have 1930s policy dictating a world that is vastly different. It's not in a physical space insofar as we can see the growth and development um, every day, uh, but it certainly has, is rapidly evolving and changing our workspace, for example. And it is coming into, into conflict uh, with, uh, with public policy. So to leave you with two examples, and I think Leah will, will talk about this in, uh, during her, her, her time, but um, I was at a, a CLE conference Recently, I'm a lawyer licensed in Florida. I have to get my CLEs. I was at a, a CLE conference on labor law. And during the Q&A section, it got into um, flexibility in the workplace, non-exempt uh, workers, and when are they working and when are they not working. And the attorney who was giving the, the presentation, it got down to things like checking emails, text messaging, working on the weekends, using things like your Apple Watch during work and outside of work. And he basically recommended to the attorneys that if given the question, the safest and easiest thing to tell clients is turn off emails at night for your employees and uh, prohibit them from working outside of the office because you cannot control their work hours and you do not know when they may hit uh, overtime, right? when they may exceed their, their 40 hours. So this will create huge hitches uh, and huge hiccups in, in work if this is the way we continue to think and approach a rapidly evolving and changing uh, technology uh, environment. In particular, uh, imagine a world where when you went home at night, you were prohibited from checking your work email. Imagine a world where you could not work on weekends. You could not work at night. You could not check your smartphones and your, and your Apple Watches. The, the types of things that we've come to rely on uh, almost on a, on a per second basis. I mean, I haven't seen anyone pull out their smartphones yet, um, but I'm actually surprised by that. But you, you, I mean, you all actually really do this on a, a regular basis, right? Constantly checking your phones. Every time you're doing that, you are by definition working. Um, and so long as these laws stay so far in the past that, that they have no idea or at least no ability to adapt and change for the current working environment, we will continue to see the problems we see today, uh, and it will only get worse as we move into the future. So thank you very much. I'm really glad Chris gave that overview because it flows right into what I wanted to talk about. And first of all, it's, it's very clear. All the graphs showed you just your own experience. You know that the economy is changing, and all of our ideas about work and careers are changing with it. And I like to point out that the rise of the sharing economy it really embodies what many young people want from work, a workplace driven by technology, convenience, and flexibility. But the sharing economy's rise it obscures a troubling economic trend. The American economy is growing slowly, and surprisingly, even with all the great success stories we see of startups, entrepreneurship is falling. Even though two-thirds of millennials want to start a business at some point in their life, 
less than 4% of private businesses are even partially owned by someone under the age of 30. This is the lowest proportion on record. And the Brookings Institution reports that business startup rates are much lower now than they were at any point in the second half of the 20th century. And this decline in entrepreneurship, we could go on for hours about why it's troubling, but it's especially problematic when starting your own business is seen as a major part of the American dream for millennials. And one reason that I like to pin this decline on is that government policy, particularly when it, particularly when it comes to labor regulation, ignores the realities of today's economy and stands in the way of millennials' economic opportunities. And the first example I want to focus on, which Chris kind of hinted at, is that the Department of Labor recently issued an administrator's interpretation, which is effective immediately, that tried to clarify the definition of independent contractors. Because this administrator's interpretation was deemed guidance, it didn't have to go before the public for comment. But this is a major problem because for just one example, it could completely upend the sharing economy. Uh, where workers are usually classified as independent contractors instead of employees. And unlike employees, independent contractors aren't entitled to a lot of uh, the employee protections, such as minimum wage, overtime pay requirements, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, collective bargaining, things like that. But this difference in treatment, it's justified because contractors work for themselves. And employees, in order to get these additional protections, they have to give up a lot of the flexibility uh, that they could have and the control over their own schedules. But going back to the Labor Department's interpretation, it officially accepts a so-called six-part economic realities test for trying to determine who's an employee and who's an independent contractor. But at the same time as it accepts this six-part test, it deliberately downplays one of the six parts, which is a control over workers' hours as a determinant in employment status. And why this could be absolutely catastrophic for the sharing economy is none of these companies control their workers' hours. But moving these workers, if, if we want to talk about moving them into an employee-employer relationship from their current but threatened independent contractor status, uh, this would obviously ruin not only the individualized work opportunities that the sharing economy presents, but also the immense consumer benefits that it provides. And just to lay it out, I'm sure all of you know this uh, by using things like Uber and Airbnb every day, but these companies provide a technological platform and support to allow customers to easily transact with service or good providers. And for this reason, a lot of these companies, they've been known as intermediaries. And those who partner with inter intermediaries, again, are independent contractors, not employees, usually. And the flexibility that contractor status offers is vital to the sharing economy's success. People always find these statistics surprising, but about 8 in 10 Lyft drivers drive for under 15 hours a week with the company. And over half of Uber drivers use the platform for less than 10 hours a week. They're using this for part-time work or supplemental income. Furthermore. Half of Lyft drivers have another job while they're working with the company, and two-thirds of Uber drivers work for another company as well. Independent contractor status, it allows the decision of when and for how long to work to be controlled by workers, not companies. And this opportunity to, let's say, smooth out earnings, meet rent, pay down student loans, or fund a new business venture, it's something that's critical to maintain, especially for uh, the 70% of Americans who are ages 18 to 24 who experience an average of 30% a change in each month over their income. So again, that's 70% of young Americans are experiencing a 30% or more change in their monthly incomes. They need an opportunity for flexible work to try to smooth this out. But the worker classification question, we can't continue to let executive agencies go on and add more and more to that uh, page count and restrictions count that Chris showed you. Instead, Congress needs to solve this problem. Uh, the alternative, really, the way I view it, is the crippling of the sharing economy by unaccountable executive agencies that are dead set on classifying the vast majority of new economy workers as employees rather than independent contractors. And unfortunately, because as I said, this most recent change was deemed guidance, we can't just use the Congressional Review Act to counter DOL's overreach. But one thing Congress can do to ensure that agency so-called guidance goes through the proper regulatory process is look at a bill that's already been introduced. Uh, it's called the Regulatory Predictability for Business Growth Act, and that's sponsored by Steve Daines. And this is just one example of a type of bill that what you would do is then when 
things are so-called long-standing interpretive, something that's going to change the nature of a regulation for over a year, it has to go through the traditional process that a formal regulation would. This is just common sense when regulation is now having such a large effect on the economy that, for example, it could completely destroy Uber. Uh, but one thing that I do want to point out is beyond bringing some much needed transparency to this debate, which is what moving guidance to the traditional regulatory process would do, it's also time to really start a conversation about updating, for example, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 to reflect the realities faced by today's workforce. And the key points to keep in mind when guiding reform, because as we said, we don't want to codify today's labor market because it's going to change again. But if we keep in mind things such as freedom, flexibility, and mobility when trying to craft the future of labor regulation, that's something that we'll be able to adapt as the economy changes. I mean, just look at right now. The current standard of an employer-employee relationship uh, is economic dependency. And this means, and I quote, suffered or permitted to work by the employer. This is, this is a completely antiquated view of today's dynamic individualized workforce. It's one out of the 1930s. It's not something that applies to today's work. And one idea that's been gaining a lot of attention is a so-called third way of worker classification, kind of creating something between independent contractors and employees. Uh, probably the most recent thing on this was by Princeton University professor Alan Kruger. And what it would do would create independent workers is what this third category would be called. And the easiest way to think about it is anyone who partners with an intermediary, like Uber or Airbnb, they would be an independent worker rather than an independent contractor. And this is something that you know it might work, it might be something to look at, but I do want to point out there are certain parts of employee protections that make absolutely no sense to extend to either independent contractors or if a new category of independent workers is created. So the first one, I'll start off with what would make sense. Many independent contractors who partner with these intermediaries, they're interested in gaining access to some benefits, whether that's, let's say, uh, auto insurance, health insurance, or something like uh, disability insurance, or moving on to retirement or savings funds. And right now, there's available options. We have IRAs, we have Affordable Care Act plans, but some people would like additional ones. And a lot of companies are looking into trying to offer these uh, benefits but the problem is, right now, the more of these benefits that they offer, the more they look like employers and might be deemed uh, all their workers would have to be employees. So this is one thing that maybe, you know, it could either be a legal carve-out created for offering these benefits where you don't become an employer, or if the third way of classification is looked at, this is something I would say could extend to the new category. But while that makes sense, adding a lot of other unemployment protections simply does not. I mean, wage and hour protections, when people are working their own schedules and can work whenever they want, minimum wage and overtime pay make absolutely no, no sense for even if we did create a new type of worker. Also, they're using their own materials and they're uh, working on the jobs. Uh, really, they could be working for multiple companies at once. So workers' compensation or work, uh, unemployment insurance, those are things that don't apply to this new economy either. But because of the option of flexibility, Work for these intermedi intermediaries, it's important to emphasize that it's transient or done in addition to other work a lot of the time. So again, we don't need the wage or hour protections or the uh, disability insurance or workers' compensation. But one of the main pushes that I've seen gaining some traction is allowing independent contractors or possibly independent workers to collectively bargain. And this is what they would need to do is amend federal antitrust law to allow non-employees to collectively bargain. But, so, uh, but if we did this, it would really uh, take away many of the benefits of the flexible entrepreneurial work that independent contractors enjoy. See, contractors right now, they're allowed to join a union such as the freelancers union, but they cannot collectively bargain. Uh, but why should independent contractors or independent workers who don't want to join a union or be represented by one be forced to pay for and follow the dictates of a collectively bargained agreement? Remember, all of these people work for themselves. There's no reason that just because 51% of a similar class wanted to vote for something, they should have to follow it when they work for themselves. And again, these workers have diverse priorities and work arrangements. For example, if we're looking at Uber drivers, those who work part-time or for supplemental income have vastly different concerns than those who use the platform for full-time work. Who's interested with the union represent if they were allowed to collectively bargain? 
These are all questions that show that majority rule could take away one of the main benefits of the new economy, and that's the diverse benefits that flexible work opportunities provide. So again, though the merits of a third way of worker classification are still up for debate, what is clear is that the future of work cannot be left to courts. They're placed in an impossible situation due to the undemocratic actions of an executive agency. So in order to promote an entrepreneurial workforce, Congress can use its power to rein in the Department of Labor to make sure that things like the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 aren't holding back a 21st century workforce. But now to pivot a bit, another example of excessive uh, government regulation standing in the way of millennials' entrepreneurial dreams is occupational licensing. And this is something that's been gaining a lot of attention recently, so I'm sure you're familiar with it, but the easiest way to summarize occupational licensing is just say that workers have to gain government's permission to work. They have to get a government permission slip. And by making it prohibitively expensive or time consuming to start work, occupational licenses increase costs for all consumers and severely limit uh, chances to build a career. And these government impose limits on work, which I should point out, they're controlled by state and local governments. But they extend far beyond professional fields such as accounting, medicine, or finance. And today, nearly one in three Americans needs government's permission to work. This is a lot. It's been a massive increase. Back in the early 1950s, it was about one in 20 workers. Now it's up to one in three. But the time and financial burdens of getting a license, it really varies depending on which state you're in and uh, what you're uh, trying to do. And it shows that also these licenses are rarely transferable if someone moves. Let's say you have a license in Texas and you wanna move you know, just across the border to Oklahoma. You may have to go through years or months of training just to be able to work in the same job you were in Texas. And this disproportionately affects families that have to move a lot due to a spouse's job. I mean, military families, this is a big problem that they face. And the variation in licensing requirements across states shows that even though policymakers constantly claim that the reason they have these restrictions in place is for public safety, that's simply not the case. Here's a few uh, stats for you that show how ridiculous occupational licensing has come. Although 10 states require four or more months to become a licensed manicurist, Alaska demands only three days, and Iowa says nine days. So if it really takes more than four months to be able to manicure nails without severely injuring customers, why do 40 states then have shorter requirements? And only three states, and where we are in Washington, D.C., license interior designers. Yet the average time it takes to get government's permission to work as an interior designer is six years. But no one in, let's say, I'm sure you all have family in different states, Texas, California, New York, or any of the other 44 states that don't license interior designers. Do any of you worry for your family member's safety if they hired someone to renovate or decorate their homes? The connection between risk to the public and the barriers to starting work in a profession, it is, it, there is no rational basis. On the other hand, bus drivers who are licensed in every state, and you could argue pose some sort of a danger if they were unqualified to the public, can begin working with an average of 90 days experience. And EMTs, you know, an occupation that literally requires people to hold lives in their hands, can start working with an average of 33 days experience. There is no reason that a government improved interior designer should have to take an average of six years when EMTs can take 33 days. The skill sets and risk uh, associated with the occupations, they simply do not line up with the requirements. And additionally, uh, if for any of you lawyers in here, the pass rate for the Louisiana florist exam, which is the only one of its kind in the entire country to become a florist, you need a license is half as high as the pass rate for the Louisiana bar exam. So it's twice as hard to become a, lawyer, or a florist in Louisiana as it is to become a lawyer. And moving on to occupations that specifically could really help college students right now, especially with the exploding costs of getting a degree, tour guides in cities such as Charleston and New Orleans need a government license before they can make money by walking and talking. And these cities, they have plenty of colleges and universities. I'd say they're even known for them but their students can't go and make a little money on the weekend to help offset the cost of college without getting an expensive government license and permission to walk and talk. And these time-consuming and costly barriers to entry, they also raise costs by keeping out competition. Morris Kleiner, who's an economist who studied occupational licensing extensively, finds that it can be up to about 15% for licensed occupations. So we're not only being kept out of jobs, but young people have to pay more. 
And if you think 15% isn't that much, this is actually a, a critique I've heard when talking about this before. I mean, try telling someone who's getting a haircut for their first job interview that an extra 15% on their haircut isn't a big deal. I mean, every dollar counts when you're trying to start your career. And the negative effects on young people from excessive occupational licensing, this is one of the reasons why President Obama's 2015 budget called for $15 million to go to states to institute common sense reform to their licensing practices. They want to make sure that licenses keep the public not establish practitioners and, and uh, businesses safe. And these further initiatives to curb states' desires to license people out of work, it deserves the support of federal policymakers. Members of Congress, they can use their influence to spur local leaders into action. And again, as this is primarily a state and local issue, the Congress can't directly do anything. But what it can do is provide the resources, guidance, and support for reforms. We've seen this happening is even in the last I'd say I started writing about occupational licensing about three years ago. And since then, it's went from a barely, uh, rarely talked about topic to now I see on Google News Alerts, it's coming up every day. People are writing about this all over the country. So congressional leaders can use their influence to drive this issue. But the support could also come in more tangible ways, such as encouraging the Bureau of Labor Statistics to collect more data on occupational licensing. Policymakers and researchers like us, we'd greatly benefit from a follow-up to BLS's April 15th release on licensing. And this related licensing to industry, age, and earnings. And it was the first report of its kind. It'd be great to go down to a state breakdown that it works on some of the work that people have had to do at uh, think tanks. But these data confirm that occupational licensing disproportionately harms young workers. Congress can also work with the White House to try to implement the best practices uh, I, that Obama started when he was doing his call for reforms. And again, just to lay them out, these best practices include prioritizing eliminating licenses that are only licensed in, or occupations that are only licensed in a few states. Also making it easier for people to move across state lines, something that disproportionately harms military families. And also harmonizing licensing requirements that vary drastically from one state to another. If people are operating perfectly fine with an average of three days of licensing in one state, you don't need six months in another one. But again, millennials have been called the startup generation. While this may be true based on their desires to start a business and their near universal respect for entrepreneurs such as Steve Jobs, unfortunately, government labor regulation hinders the ability for millennials to follow through on their uh, entrepreneurial dreams. And this obstructionism is clear in both Department of Labor's treatment of independent contractors and in states' desires to license young people out of work. In order to promote a 21st century workforce, Congress needs to use its power to rein in the Department of Labor and incentivize states to restore common sense practices to their licensing schemes. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm discussing the new overtime regulations, and it fits perfectly into, into this setup right here, um, especially in Chris's remarks about, you know, not your grandfather's workplace. So what's going on right now is, um, so currently the, the overtime regulations uh, from the Fair Labor Standards Act say that anyone under 23,000, under 23K, uh, their employee, employers have to track their hours uh, such that if they work more than 40 hours a week, they have to be paid over time, so time and a half for each hour worked over, over 40 hours a week. Currently, the Department of uh, Labor is going through trying to update these regulations, uh, and they're kind of doing the opposite of what Chris says <laughs> that should be going on, because in their, in their mindset, the update of the overtime regulations means that taking that 23K number and increasing it to a much larger number. What they want to do is increase that number to 50,000 okay? so, uh, 50,440. So that means anyone making under you know, 50,440 will have their employers track their hours. Um, and the employers will then have to pay them time and a half for every hour worked over 40 hours a week. Now, in some sense, you can see the point, their point of view, right? Their point of view is that uh, you know, we want to make sure that there's fair uh, fair wages being paid, and if people are working over 40 hours a week, we should be able to, you know, employers should pay them time and a half. Um, and part of the proposal is that, you know, th this, this is part of the justification of the proposal is to increase 
uh, people's wages. So just put that in the mindset. That, that's, that's their justification. Well, there's two main problems with it. First is that, one, are, are they going to meet that objective? So before I get into the millennial and how this impacts startups and, and the young generation, um, I want to talk about whether they would, what evidence there is to meet that to meet that um, that endpoint, which is to raise people's wages. It turns out that if you do the research on overtime regulation and the impact it has, is that a lot of employers respond to the overtime regulation by cutting the base salary of of, of their employees. So if the if this regulation is increased, if, if, if this regulation gets passed, which they're in the process of doing it right now, the impact would be that a lot of people's base salaries would be would be cut, and we don't even know if they'll meet their objective of increasing of, of increasing the overtime um, of increasing people's uh, pays. The second part of this is that it just doesn't make any sense in today's 21st century world. So one one application and one example of this is a tech startup world. So I do research on tech startups and I interview um, tech entrepreneurs and, and a lot of young people working at the both both entrepreneurs and the employees at these at these companies. And the main thing that you get out of this, you know, the scene is that it is not your grandfather's workplace, right? I mean, these guys are working not nine to five hours. Some are going in at 9 p.m., working until like 2 a.m. and then going home. There's ping pong tables. <laughs> so during the work during the work day, you might uh, you know take a take a 10 minute break and play ping pong, and then you might get back into a lunch meeting with your you know with another you know an, with an engineer, or you might step back uh, uh, step out and meet. Um, you know, another co-founder somewhere at another startup, and you're constantly there, there's this atmosphere of like we're trying to we're trying to make a difference, and we have this idea, and they're constantly in the process of working, um, and they sometimes they have like lunch delivered to their you know to their workplace, so it doesn't fit in this model of okay you have to work nine to five and you have to work forty hours a week, and after forty hours a week your employer has to pay you time and a half. Well. That's not what happens in the 21st century in these in these young startups, and a lot of um, and a lot of people see that. Now, the other aspect of this is if you know, it's a little bit of what Jared was saying is if we're trying to help um, young people achieve their dream of owning their own business or being an entrepreneur or having a startup, it's not easy right now to do that. So, if you're a startup, uh, you can't get a bank loan, and part of the reason is that banks don't know how to evaluate startup companies, so. If you're like, oh, like, what's your collateral? And they're like, I don't know. I work from the basement of my parents' home, and I have this app, <laughs> right? Like, what, what, what can they take from you? So, um, it's it's virtually impossible to get a bank loan if you're trying to start a business, which is, you know, different than your typical, you know, your typical business. So, what they have to do instead is raise money, so fundraise. Um, and in the beginning, they don't have a lot of money, so you're constantly the the part, the main role of the CEO at you know, as a young startup, um, is to just raise money, trying to raise money, go talk to investors, trying to pitch their product. This is what we need this money for. So they actually have, um, they actually have very little cash flow in the in the beginning of the startup. And what they do in um, in response is pay employees in equity. So they'll have a lower salary, and as a result, they'll get they get paid more in equity. And part of the reason that they, the other reason they do that is because it ties the workers. Uh, you know, the worker, it, it ties their incentives to, you know, working hard at the company. So if the company succeeds, the worker will succeed as well. So this is like the early Google um, employees, right? They were paid in equity, and after Google took off, they're like, you know, millionaires and billionaires now. Um, so in the beginning, and, and the other thing about a startup is that there's no revenue stream in the big, again, as they're starting up. So they don't have any customers, they don't have a product, they're just trying to build the product. But they need money to build the product. So there's virtually no, um, no money in the beginning for them to pay people extra overtime and to pay them in cash, which is why they pay them in equity. So if you talk to any of these entrepreneurs, and I have, and, and I'll read some quotes from them, this, this regulation, which on the one hand, we can see the justification from the Department of Labor's point of view, but from the other hand, it just doesn't make sense in, for these group of people, right, for tech entrepreneurs, because there's no extra money that they have in the beginning to try to pay everyone time and a half, and also it doesn't make sense uh, from from their point of view, to to pay someone based on hour, 
on the hours that they work. They pay in equity or they pay in the outputs that they produce, not the hours that they work. So um, just reading from, I just want to read, you know, I went and interviewed a couple of tech entrepreneurs just to ask from what, from their point of view, how would this regulation impact them? So uh, I have one who is a, an owner of a commercial real estate company. And he says, as a small business owner of a finance startup, I attract employees that believe in the vision and are willing to work overtime to accomplish that mission. Our mission has drastic financial restraints at the juncture, and it's exceptionally efficient in its compensation structure to accommodate growth and stability. Our employees know this and still work overtime because they believe in our mission and understand that today we can't complete, we can't compete with the compensation packages of our enormous competitors that have been around uh, for, in some cases, centuries. However, our employees get this. They could have worked for big companies that pay more, but their motivation is not reduced to money. They choose to work for my company because they believed in the mission, the team, and the culture, and are proud to be getting the experience and responsibility our firm can offer. Ultimately, because they know our culture, everyone will be paid more, and the company and the company ever be able to afford it, but right now, you know, our mission is getting there. So the, the point being, and then he goes on later to explain about how if they had to, if this overtime regulation passes, he's gonna have to cut a bunch of his employees out. Because they can't afford to hire the employees in the beginning because there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of cash in the beginning for, uh, for the company. Um, another, another entrepreneur says, a young company can't afford a huge salary or great benefits at first, but it can offer equity and the opportunity to be part of something big. Young founders often go months at a time without receiving pay, only earning sweat equity uh, for the time they put in. These companies would be stretched to the seams if this extra time paid for not in cash now, but, but in the potential for future earnings is limited. Uh, and just one more, and this is a summary of another entrepreneur who's, who, uh, again, from his point of view, he's trying to start a business, young, out of college, and when you talk to him about these regulations, it's it's like, you know, it doesn't make sense because it's like, I'm trying to start this business, this doesn't apply, this doesn't make sense in what I'm trying to do. And he says, regulatory committees often act as though they cannot imagine a world where a few hundred or thousand dollars can make the difference between success and failure. If you raise our costs even model, modest, modestly, uh, you will put some of us out of business. And that's true because they have, their margins are so thin in the beginning that if you increase if, if if you increase their costs, you are going to put a lot of them out of business. And the problem is that tech entrepreneurs are the heart of innovation right now, and a lot of young millennials and want to be the entrepreneurs or they want to work for these startups. The other problem of why this regulation doesn't make sense is because we live in an information economy now. Again, not your grandfather's workplace, right? So in an, in a manufacturing economy, you go in, there's you know, work, you go into a factory, right? You check in, you get out, and you're working. In an information economy, it's harder to define the boundaries of what counts for work. And this is part of what Chris and, and, and Jared have been saying, is that does email count as work, right? So if, if you're thinking about it in an information economy where you know you have to respond to a client after work hours, like does, if you have to respond to a client after work hours, does that count as work? Uh, so uh, and, and other things, like if you're going on a lunch meeting with another, you know, another startup uh, owner, and you're responding, to, you know, you're having this lunch meeting, are you no longer working, are you working, yeah, you know, but you're taking lunch. So it's, it's, un, it's a little bit unclear about what, what counts as work and what doesn't. And another factor about this is worker, worker flexibility. So Chris mentioned that, you know, we're not using the word telecommuting anywhere, but I, I've used that in my, in my paper. Uh, so instead of telecommuting, we're gonna say, <laughs> we're gonna say working from home, right? So one thing that's going on right now, and as Chris pointed out, is a lot of people are telecommuting or working from home. And one reason they're able to do that is because their employers don't um, compensate the employees based on hours worked, but they, but they do it based on product or output that you, you know, that you, you give to the employer. So if you're working from home and like, you take two hours off and you're just, you decide to take a shower, or you're like eating cereal or whatever, but you're working from home. They're not tracking your hours <laughs> while you're at home trying to work. They're, tr they're tracking output. Hey, did you get this? I need this by 6 p.m. tonight because we have a client meeting tomorrow and we need to present this at the client meeting. So a lot of the reason that we get worker flexibility and telecommuting or working from home is because 
we don't have to track, employers don't have to track our hours worked. Like, did you put enough, eight, did you put eight hours in, I'm paying you for eight hours? No, they're paying you for output. So in an information economy, um, we're seeing more and more employers going to pay, with, pay for the output produced and not for the hours that you work. And it makes sense for them to do, and it makes sense for them to offer, you know, telecommuting, working from home benefits and worker flexibility if they're paying you for output produced and not for the hours that you're putting in. Because if you're working eight hours from home, how do they know, like, that two of those hours you weren't, you know, like reading a book on neuroscience, right? <laughs> um, so the, 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 main, the main reason, so the, the thing I want to emphasize about this is it's not, you know, you know, we're on the Hill, it's in DC, it's not a, you know, a right-left issue, it's like does it make sense or does it not make sense issue. So in this case, overtime regulations for an information economy might not make sense. And the Department of Labor, uh, should, and they haven't done this, is to analyze how employers and how it impacts all the different industries. Because in their mindset, they're in, in your grandfather's workplace, right? Their mindset is, okay, you're going in, here's the employer, and they're paying you, and you have to work eight hours, and in those eight hours, you're working really hard, and now um, you have to work 48 hours instead of 40 hours a week, so you should get paid more for those hours. And like, you know, there's a clear delineation between what is work and what is not work. Um, and in an information economy, it's not that easy. And so, in order for us to analyze the impact of this regulation, the Department of Labor has to think about how it impacts the 21st century, not your grandfather's workplace. And what they've missed completely from their from their reports is thinking about how it might impact things like working from home and whether email counts as work, and specifically how it impi might impact the tech sector. So the tech startup sector is the heart of innovation right now. It's really where, you know, you know you've had Uber transform the ride sharing industry, right? You have 23andMe transform the medical industry. You have WeWork transferring workspace. And there's so much more. There's so, there's just this thriving like heartbeat of innovation coming out of that. And the last thing we want to do is destroy the heart of innovation by, by imposing these regulations that make it impossible for them to get off the ground. And with that, I think I'm out of time. Thanks. So I'm going to give you another anecdote. Um, I'm Generation X. Um, I won't give you any more so you can take me any more specifically. But in the 1990s, when I was working here on the Hill, I took my parents, who were born in the 1930s, to Mount Vernon for the first time. I grew up on a farm. They grew up on a farm. We were going through the, the barns near the house. And they're standing there, very casually pointing at things and going like, do you remember when Uncle Charlie Bowles used that? And when... Uncle Rodney used that, or when we used this, when we got started with a run farm. Well, I'm a history major, but I got a history lesson. This is a generation that are now in their 80s that went from George Washington's technology to a man on the moon to Apple Plus. One, one generation. So my, my, my dad sits there with my four-year-old and she's like all over the iPad and he just, he knows what he can get out of it, he just doesn't know how to do it. So if that generation is experiencing that type of innovative change, what is my four-year-old and nine-year-old going to be experiencing in their lifetime? So that's why we're coming to the question, is a 60-year-old statue really supposed to be the tether for the policy decisions we're making today? Or is it an entirely different approach of questions and information that we start with that then tell us how we're supposed to be shaping statute and regulation? So your guys' time is valuable. So if anybody has any questions, go first. But I have like three or four. <laughs> I'll fill in if you don't. But please go ahead and, and ask the panel anything that you have an interest in. Um, the sharing economy is also known as the 1099 economy, and you went through regulations, but you didn't talk about the difficulty of tracking all this tax reporting and um, how, how they deal with that and what we can do to make it easier for 1099 workers to be compliant with the law. 
Yeah. So there was a, I think there was a survey done this time last year of 1099 workers, and roughly like 75%, so three quarters of them, when asked what their greatest frustrations with working in the sharing economy are, uh, said some variation of tracking income and expenses or understanding legal and tax implications of everything that they do. Uh, so it's, it's certainly complicated. Uh, and there are a lot of people, I think the average sharing economy worker um, lasts three months. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that that's the first quarter that they actually have to report things. <laughs> and then they realize, my god, what did I get myself into? And then they just leave. Uh, so I think to, to a certain degree, that's certainly a, a huge issue and we didn't get into it. But I think that there are big questions with regard to fundamental tax reform, right? That's a, that's a big issue here in terms of treating these individual workers as businesses, right? They have the same business reporting requirements, right? It's the one-man company, no longer the company man. They have the same reporting requirements as any other business for the most part. Um, in finding a way, and I think this is one thing Jared talked about, is finding a way um, to accommodate the fact that these workers really are different and fit them into the system uh, in a way that isn't just gerrymandering what they're doing into the way we're thinking about it, but changing the way they think about it. So changing the way that we uh, report income and expenses. A lot of that has to do with are they independent contractors or, or, um, uh, or employees. The other big issue is 1099 workers have to pay both sides of the employment tax. So all of us pay six and a half, seven and a half percent uh, in employment tax. They pay 15.1. Um, that's a huge issue, but I mean, these things, and this is the point of the sharing economy, I think, it isn't just dislodging the way we think about transportation and hospitality, but it's actually begging really important questions about taxes and Social Security. Um, there isn't an easy answer to that, so I can't sit here and say, oh, if we do X, Y, and Z, it'll be fixed. But it's certainly a big answer, and I think the people who are doing research on this, that's the area where most of the value can be created at this point, is really untangling those, those sticky questions. I don't have an answer. Off the top of my head. Yeah. Just really quick, when Alan Kruger had his proposal of creating the third way independent workers, he had said move withholding, make it so that they would uh, that they have tax withholding. One problem with that, I mean, it's something that would not destroy the sharing economy by any means compared to some of the other things I talked about. But what that would do is really you're working so inconsistently, it'd be hard to estimate it. Uh, and also, if you're withholding it, like people still have to pay it either side, so maybe it's a good thing that they have to see how much is going into Social Security and Medicare because you're losing it in wages otherwise when your employer is paying it. But that is a good question. It's something, Chris, I don't have a great answer, but I'm looking forward to digging into it. And I think in, in terms of the way people think about the tax implications of what they do, uh, many of us can't get to the point where we're, you know, we think about marginal wages, uh, marginal tax rates where we say, okay, I've hit the point where uh, every extra dollar I earn has greater tax implications than the dollars before this, so I'm going to stop working. We can't do that, right? We're all employed. Sharing economy workers can, right? As soon as they feel that that one, that, that marginal dollar, like that one extra dollar changes their entire tax treatment, they can stop. Um, and I think you, you see that in the way that workers come and go, in the way that you see people uh, actually organizing their activity in the sharing economy, not based on what uh, is best for them oftentimes, but what makes it easier, easiest for them to deal with the current system. Uh, and there's it's certainly big, uh, big, big problems uh, in this space. Just a real quick question. In terms of the, um, any of the presidential candidates that are um, out there, you know, has anyone really said, you know, address these issues or, you know, in the, in the time to address any of these types of things? Uh, I, I actually, I don't just, so, but yeah, I don't I, believe it or not, they have uh, talked about the sharing economy a little bit. Uh, Bernie Sanders, it's really easy. He just said he's not a fan of Uber. You can quote me on that. That was his exact quote. Um, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, uh, it's a little more confusing. She admits that you know a lot of the sharing economy companies are really exciting. And there's a lot of innovation going on. But also on the independent contractor employee question that I spent a lot of time on, she uh, is in stark disagreement with me on that. She thinks that they should be employees and that they need 
Department of Labor to take action to crack down on people who are quote unquote misclassifying their workers. And I would argue that taking a class from the 1930s and somehow applying it to today's economy where you could never imagine that you could hail a you know, jitney cab from your little phone. I mean, that's, it's not something that... So you're calling an operator. You didn't yeah, even have yeah, a phone. Call it right? an operator to get a jitney. Uh, so I don't think people are misclassifying. And what I worry about is when we're talking about the sharing economy, now the push for, uh, really it's the push for unionization, which needs to make them first be employees. That's what's clouding a lot of uh, politicians' judgment who otherwise fully understand the great benefits that we've seen from this technological revolution. And I would also say that while there's stark disagreement among politicians on this and the way they talk about it, there's also a lot of agreement on it. I mean, the, you have Elizabeth Warren at the Recode conference last year saying almost the exact same thing that Rand Paul is saying about the sharing economy. They sound very similar when they talk about it. It's not going away. We, it's essentially the, the, the 1099 chart that I showed that all of that predates the, the, the mass growth of, of the sharing economy that in many ways this is an efficient response by the market and innovators to innovate our way out of the problem of work, right? As, as traditional employment is stagnating, uh, people are finding new and innovative ways to continue to, to work. And I think that's one thing that I, it seems to be at least across the board in agreement among politicians, regardless if they're running for any office or no office at all, is that the sharing economy is not going anywhere. The future of work is vastly changing, uh, and it's, it, it would behoove us <laughs> to find answers sooner rather than later because it will only continue to cause problems. So I'm going to throw out one question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, um, just curious about, uh, you know, not, not just millennials that are graduating from college, and, you know, I think it's a particularly overtime thing, we probably hit them, we only to like 15,000 plus, but um, how uh, millennials and regulation are impacted. Uh, people take like upward mobility from particularly from like poverty lines, like something like uh, uh, like Postmates and those deliveries where all you you just need your feet or a bicycle and a smartphone to actually be able to make money and like have the opportunities to pull people out of poverty. How regulation can be for preventing that or impacting that. So one thing um, that I would say that millennials are we found when we did this research and also talked to entrepreneur, uh, to employers is, so it's a little bit of an unintended consequence. It hits a little bit of, you know, um, so one thing that employers responded, one way that they responded was that if there's the overtime regulation, so let's say you're out of college and you're making 40K um, at a company, um, and if there's this overtime regulation and they have to now pay you overtime for every hour worked over 40 hours a week, uh, one way that employers responded was that they would get rid of that junior role, let's say it's a marketing associate role, and bring in a senior role. <laughs> and the senior role is like the director of marketing or like a marketing coordinator. And in that case, like what they're doing is like the guy with the less experience going in as the marketing associate is now like out of a job and because and then they push the threshold either above the they can push the threshold even above the 50,000 now um, or uh, you know they, they push they will go above the 50,000 threshold that senior role now has more responsibilities and now they're the marketing coordinator and the junior role is out of a job so like that's someone you know someone potentially right out of college is making that is trying to get that $40,000 junior role but you're ultimately eliminating these junior roles for for these for for people to go in, you know, for not low skilled, but you know, they're not high skilled yet. They're just straight out of college potentially, or maybe they didn't go to college, but they're trying to get this role to gain experience. And you're kind of eliminating that role and that ability for them to get that experience. Um, and the other, the other thing I want to, I want to emphasize that one um, startup employee mentioned was that as a young person, and this particular employee had dropped out of college, and now he works at a startup. He says, the one thing that I have is a lot of time, right? He's like, I'm young, I don't have kids. <laughs> and he's like, and part of the reason that I want to work all these long hours at the startup is because I'm gaining experience and skills, and it's a really great investment. And think about what, how the employer would respond if, they, if he had to pay them overtime, right? Now he's like, okay, you can't work more than 40 hours a week. And the guy's like, but I want to. <laughs> like, it's for my own benefit. Like, I want to get, and yeah, this college dropout works at a startup. And he's like, I want to get, I, 
like I have a lot of time. What I'm trying to do is get experience working. I'm trying to get more skills. But the employer's going to have to cut his hours if he works over 40 hours a week because that's cost on the, on the startup. And as we talked about, they don't have a lot of money in the beginning. I also think so to the sharing economy and income inequality question, uh, there was an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, I think, that was basically like the sharing economy is not going to solve income inequality. And it's like, of course, like you're not going to make you're not going to make a million dollars driving for Uber. You, I mean, like, that's just the the truth of the matter is it's not going to happen. But for those people on on the fringes of society, it's opening up doors that they otherwise probably wouldn't have had open to them. But also on the flip side of it, in many ways, it's mooting the entire question of income inequality when you think that like a vast majority, like nine in 10 people when asked why they use the sharing economy as consumers, right? Not as workers, but as consumers, their response is it makes life more affordable and more efficient, right? People do it because it makes life better and it's cheaper. It's just uh, um, an overall uh, cheaper option for them oftentimes. So you think, for example, uh, someone making you know, $25,000 a year probably can't afford a car, but they don't need a car because all they have to do is push a button. I'm sure they own a smartphone. All they have to do is push a button and a car comes whenever they want it, right? So these issues, if you want someone to come deliver your dry cleaning, right? That's like something that like, wow, you must work at a you know, white shoe law firm. No, I have Washio and I push a button and somebody comes up and they pick up my dry cleaning and they drop it off wherever I want it. Right? At home, at work, I give them an address and they come. I give them an address and a time and they come. And then they drop it off when I ask them to. The whole idea of, you know, the, the technology is making sort of the whole issue of income inequality rather moot when you think that, you know, you can ride in an Uber and it'll be, you know, an Uber black, a $20 ride. If you wanted to, five years ago, hire that same black car to drive you around, it's probably 150 bucks, right? drastically reduces the cost of getting a black car. Um, those types of things I think people are mostly, when they talk about income inequality, are talking about how much are you making. Um, but I think what we really ought to be focusing on, and the thing that's often missed in the sharing economy debate is, how is it affecting the affordability of the life you want to live? And I think that's one thing that's definitely missed in the sharing economy. It's a huge value add that oftentimes is just clearly, I think, beyond the conversation where people only focus on the working side of the sharing economy. Yeah, and I would point out with occupational licensing, I think that's one of the reasons why this has become a bipartisan agreement point, which obviously, as you all know, is pretty rare today. But I can't find a single person on the federal level who's like, no, yeah, yeah, this makes perfect sense. We should have interior designers go six years before they can work. Yep. Like, no one actually argues that except for a few state local politicians who are completely in established industries' pockets. So this is where I think the federal and can play a great role of you know really coming together and saying this is you know we want to stand up for the people's right to work. You never hear a politician on a stump speech be like we want to ruin people's right to work. People should not be allowed to pursue the career they want. Like this is a winning argument, and that's why it's starting to go somewhere now. And you can see in President Obama's he said it harms young and people with low incomes the most. And that's clear. I agree a hundred percent. Well, thank you very much for coming. You got. Yeah, I was just, uh, my, my question is sort of tying the, the consumer side to the occupational licensure. And to your point you just made about no one on the federal level, they're actually, Representative Blackburn and Senator Portman have federal occupational licensure bills that are being considered right now. And the fly in day for their trade association is today. So if any of you take meetings, keep, keep an eye out for those people who are going to be lobbying for the occupational licensure bill. Um, and we didn't know that when we scheduled this today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Um, so, but the, there, there's a lot of research, and you mentioned that occupational licensure can will raise prices about 15%, but what a lot of people will say is they think that the quality and safety is somehow improved by occupational licensure, and that the 15% increase either, like you said, isn't that much or is worth the, the quality increase. Um, there, there's a lot of research that, would, would, that counters that fact. There's a series of, of papers from the University of Tennessee that shows when you uh, license electrician, electricians, the incidence of home electrocution deaths increases because people can't afford to hire an electrician, so they try to do it themselves and then they kill themselves. Uh, incidence of rabies is increased when you license veterinarians because people either can't find a veterinarian or they're priced out of the market and then their animal's sick and they can't afford to take it to a vet. Um, so my question is, you, you mentioned in the sharing economy that there's this consumer side that everybody is thinking about. 
But with occupational licensure, why is the, the not just cost, but also safety and quality issue that there it is uh, not talked about as, as frequently when people are talking about yeah. it? I'm, I'm glad, glad you brought, you brought that, that up. I mean, the 1970s study on electrocution was kind of the groundbreaking one that showed that, hey, when something's you know drastically more expensive, idiots I'd, like I would probably do to try to <laughs> tangle with the electric problem I'm having. But a more recent study, believe it or not, uh, academics are so lucky they get to study the most ridiculous things. Someone actually studied the quality of bouquet prepared by licensed florists and not licensed florists. Believe it or not, there was no difference. So <laughs> even the pass rates half as low as the Louisiana bar, there was no discernible difference in quality of floral arrangements. This goes on and on to more serious ones as well. While there are some cases that sure, you know, uh, some people who go through a lot of training, I want someone, if I'm getting brain surgery, who has the best training, the high qualifications. But people can find that out now. People, when we talk about occupational licensing on the consumer side, it's as if policymakers have never heard of Yelp, Google reviews, Angie's list. I mean, when was the last time you called a state government office to figure out if a restaurant has food safety inspection and what's got? No, you go on Yelp or you look on Google reviews or Twitter and now, and especially service providers in the types of industries that are most affected by occupational licensing, they realize that if they make me mad, for example, I can just let everyone know on Twitter how mad I am at, you know, front air. But uh, something that's more powerful than a government review. So when we're talking about the consumer side of occupational licensing, we need to keep in mind that the power dynamic between businesses and consumers has shifted uh, dramatically towards consumers. And that we're just creating a one-size-fits-all system, a do you pass or do you not pass, when today we can have a wide variety where consumers can pick what's right for themselves because they have that power now. And, and just to add to that, I think often, so the, the study you're talking about with electricians, I think is 50, 45 years old yeah, at, th at this point. Um, that predates right, uh, most of the information technology you're talking about. But also uh, the idea that Yelp now is now integrating hospital wait times on the reviews for hospitals. So you can actually go on when choosing, not a, there's an emergency and you're like, first let me check Yelp to see which <laughs> one I'll get in quickest. But that's an option, right? If you're like, you're like, which hospital should I go to? Like you're not gonna go to the State's Department of Health or, or CMS's website and say, what was the average wait time over the last 18 months? There's a huge profit motive for these companies to provide the best, cleanest, most easily and readily accessible information to you to make these decisions. And oftentimes when we talk about occupational licensing, it's completely lost in the debate. People don't go to bar associations to figure out who are the best lawyers, right? They have all of these other things like, like Jared was saying. And they're actually a lot of these reputational feedback mechanisms are now far beyond and just outpacing the ability of these government regulators to actually provide the type of information people want in the form they want it when they want it. So that's definitely something that has certainly been missed in the conversation for a long time because those things didn't exist, but they do now. Kind of a corollary on that is um, there's been some controversy over Ubers. You, you, you rate your drivers, but drivers also rate the customers, and there is some controversy over whether customers that have bad ratings and are uh, not getting service. But, but think, just, so think about it this way is, it actually creates a better environment for everyone involved. When you think that all of us, if all of us were to like call an Uber right now, my guess is the person with the highest rating would get selected first. So the, the, the drivers have an option. So we're all actually competing with one another to be the nicest, best version of ourselves that we can. So it isn't just, <laughs> right? So it isn't just like the anonymity of a taxi driver where he yells at you and you yell back at him and then you slam on his hood as you walk away. That, that's completely gone. The, and the, the ability to hide in anonymity in today's economy is gone. Right. So a uh, government bureaucrat is already beginning to wonder if there's a racial bias to those driver ratings. Yeah, so there's certainly things that can't be corrected. For the, and this is one thing in the, in, the, in the settlement, for example, for better or for worse, the recent settlement two weeks ago or last week from Uber, one of the things is actually Uber drivers will have an opportunity to challenge ratings if they think that they've been rated unfairly or poorly, or uh, y there are studies now that say there's like systemic biases in the way people select who comes and stays in their Airbnb or who they get Airbnbs from. Um, those, are, those are part of that, but with that being said, those same studies 
show that, like, for example, an Airbnb host who's engaged in systemic racial discrimination in renting out their place, their rental replacement rates are drastically lower than someone who's not engaged. So there's a huge cost, right? The economics of discrimination, you know, there's a huge cost to being discriminatory in, in, in the marketplace and saying, I will do business with you, but not you for some arbitrary reason. Uh, and so it creates a huge uh, incentive to not do that, right? If you're, if you're only selecting people that look and think and act like you, you're not going to last very long on Airbnb because there are other people that are going to take those, those renters and you won't get them. So some of that stuff, because we're in a hyper-competitive marketplace, will actually go by the wayside because there isn't the ability to be anonymous and there isn't the high barriers to entry that allow you to act in a discriminatory way and get away with it. Now, if you're a company that engages in systemic biases, you know, racial, religious, whatever, it's very easy, like in, a, in the tech sector, for somebody else to just jump in and take all those people you don't want to do business with, and there goes your $64 billion valuation overnight, right? Like those types of things that I think in a hyper-competitive environment like we see in the sharing economy, it's just very difficult to act that way in any sort of long period of time. And, and I just want to add to Chris's point uh, that if, so even if there's racial biasing as compared to what, if you look at the taxi, <laughs> what was going on in the taxi industry and the taxi cabs, you've not lived in New York if they're making that argument because that was like the main point, and I live in New York so I'm allowed to say this, that was the main issue with the taxi cabs that they were racial profiling and not picking up any, um, any people, and even if you told them like, hey, I'm going to the Bronx, they're like, we're not taking you, and they would like drive away. So then you have to get into like this weird gypsy cab, and it was really scary. So like one time I got in, I took a picture of the license plate, and I'm like texting my friend, I'm like, I'm in this car. <laughs> At this. <laughs> anyway, the point is, and and but, but anyway, the, so there is there is a lot of um, it, as compared to what, even if they're doing it. But then Chris's point is that well, if Uber begins to do this, then Lyft will be like, hey, we're the it's an opportunity for Lyft to come in and say, we're the non-racist, <laughs> like, we're the non-racist uh, ride sharing, right? And so Uber doesn't want to, like, doesn't want that to be their, their brand name, right? So there is an incentive, and there's, and even if there is, there's a huge profit opportunity for Lyft or Via or, like, these other ones to come in and be like, oh, well, we're the non-racist ones, right? So even if they're, whereas that was not the case for taxi cabs, right, they were able to do it because there was no competition, no one to check them on that, on the, the thing to do that. And one more thing. I used to be a five-star Uber uh, customer. I got dropped down to 4.6. <laughs> and uh, I got con it, it is confirmed that what Chris said is that there is an algorithm that the highest, um, highest rated customers and the highest rated drivers match. It's part of the algorithm. Like there's different things that make you match, but one of them is your ratings. This has been great. It's a, it's a wonderful educational opportunity for us to, to hear what your questions are and answer that. So thank you very much for participating. Um, I think one of the things that we hear today is that job security used to be synonymous with economic opportunity in the United States. That's parents' generation, up to Generation X. And that's changing. So with that change, what defines economic security and opportunity? So that's the question I leave today, and we'll try to do more programs.